Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. Let's go ahead and open it up. Anything goes, any questions, be it for yourself, for clients, about classes, whatever you'd like. Sorry, I'm losing juice here. I got to plug in. And then go ahead, Robert and Sandra. Hey, Robert. Good afternoon, Greg. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing good. How about you? I'm doing well, thank you. I have a whole group of questions today, uh, okay. and I'll start. I have a new client that has a couple of conditions and I wanted to talk through, they're not unusual conditions, I just don't know for sure how to treat them. Uh, okay. And so it's sort of like, uh, what do I do? Uh, the first one, and probably not her most important one, but the first one is a migraine condition that she's had for quite a while. Uh, okay. They come and go, it's not constant, but it's uh, pretty severe. And I was okay. looking in several of the books and there were, there was a long list of oils to possibly use, and I uh, presume sustain, sustain inhalation. But how do we know which one? And there were four or five major ones that were pointed out, marjoram, basil, lavender, peppermint, vetiver. Is there a technique to use? Is there yeah. a diagnostic Yeah, there, there, there kind of is. Like the, the thing with migraines. So the, the other condition is with this person as well, or...? The other, yes. Well, what's the other condition? I'm just curious. Uh, the other condition is she is having hip issues uh, and longstanding. Um, she said in basically the last six months to a year, it's gotten to the point that she's not really comfortable exercising anymore. And that's part of her stress release. And part mm -hmm. of her, she feels better when she exercises regularly. And she had the hip x right? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. And that's that sort of goes to this both of these questions is what should I be asking? What are the things they that... they the hip, the issue with the hip is we'd want to know if um, there's been an x-ray because she, like she's already showing indicators like, okay, it's painful. And then with exercise, it's getting worse, which, you know, anytime you exercise something, um, it can potentially aggravate it or whatever, but with especially a weight bearing joint, be it the, the hips and the knees, that if it's a bone on bone situation, when they're exercising, it's gonna cause more inflammation, it's gonna cause more pain. It's actually not gonna be, um, bringing any sort of relief, it actually is aggravating the condition. And if they want to exercise, you can have them do, um, if, if, if this even works, like sometimes even this is too much, but to do some sort of like, um, like water exercise, like getting into the pool and moving around, basically taking some of the weight off that joint. But okay. if it's bone on bone, like any sort of movement is just like too, two things rubbing together that are just causing friction and irritation and inflammation. And okay. So but a lot of times, you know, people still will say you need to exercise that, but um, a lot of times the thing that brings relief is um, like resting that joint. And so, you, you know, in the older days, um, when somebody started displaying symptoms like that, they would have them like rest a lot more and not exercise as much. And so for, for most things, exercise can, can be helpful, but like when it's a bone on bone situation, different philosophies float, float around. And just over the years, I've just seen the ones that rest it more are in less pain, have less inflammation, um, can go longer before there's some sort of intervention or something. And so the thing that you'll want to do with the hip is um, uh, the, that joint relief, that blend works really well for this. Um, make it real strong in an ointment. Um, and she needs to rub it on at least a couple of times a day. Um, I would rotate um, something also. I mean, spasms are, are going to be there. The joint relief will take some of it, but um, when, when a joint is compromised, part of how the body tries to um, manage the compromised area is it 
generate spasms in and around the area to try to like splint that joint to keep you from moving it so much. Okay. And so um, part, part of that, it does restrict movement, but at the same time, it also restricts like blood flow and things like that. And the restriction of blood flow, you know, if it's bone on bone, there's kind of no saving the joint, you know, the cartilage is already gone, but it still keeps the joint as healthy as possible. And so um, the thing that I, I usually tend to do in something like this is, you know, use the joint relief and then you use something that is a lymphatic stimulant of some sort. So lymphatic blend, chocolate root cleanser. You could actually even use the arthritic hair. It's not so much that that's a lymphatic stimulant. I mean, it is partially but the thing with that is it's, it's four deposits. But another thing that you could say for that is that it's good for uh, dealing with tendonitis. And when, when something is really splinting an area quite substantially, um, like a hip or a knee, you are developing a bit of t uh, tendonitis or what they call tenosynovitis, which is you know, basically an inflamed bursa sac in the area. And so, you know, they're real similar, but there's more bursa related issues because it's an arthritic condition. And, and so um, you, you basically start to like inflame the capsule and like, you know, the joint capsule and all this. And so the, the um, arthritic care can be good for that. Even just mixing eucalyptus citradora and helichrysum together even amounts and putting it in an ointment or an alcohol, um, you know, for a liniment, um, uh, that can be helpful. And then they just need to keep rotating it, rotating it, rotating it, rotating it. Um, she can use the galbanum either topically on the wrist or internally. And then also, um, you know, usually I would say black cumin and she still could do that, but you might want to switch over to um, uh, ginger, like have her take ginger, like two, three, four drops at a time. And ginger helps to deal with the inflammatory material that's been generated. The, the other reason that I like the Arthrocare for this is um, it's pretty heavy on the lovage. And, and, you know, it's got other things in it as well, but the lovage is really good for cleaning up inflammatory material out of the tissue. Like it helps to basically detoxify the tissue. And the issue with um, uh, a joint where it's bone on bone is that, you know, it keeps generating inflammatory material and it, it keeps um, aggravating the condition in the hip you know, here's the hip, but it could also be the knee or something like that. And at some point, um, that inflammatory material and this, uh, the stagnant lymphatic movement actually becomes systemic. Like it just starts to affect the whole body. Like, so what will happen is they'll start getting fatigued more, their head will start getting real fuzzy, joints will start hurting that haven't been compromised, but you know, they're compromised because you're not feeling good, but like shoulders will start to hurt, elbows will start to hurt, you know, they'll start getting weird forms of like mm -hmm. different parts of the areas. And that is that inflammatory material and the lymphatic system has turned that localized uh, uh, inflammation into a, like a, basically a whole body um, uh, inflammation. And so like whenever you start to see fuzzy thinking, um, Th that that is the body is like getting toxic and so that kind of plays into a little bit of what we could talk about and how to approach the migraines you know migraines you almost have to kind of come up with you, you can almost have like a little bit of a template to to do but m migraines are like kind of like blood pressure where they can be kind of complex but if you look at what happens with migraines is you, you know, the the center in your low back area, the Ming Men, is shooting excessive amounts of energy up high. And um, the energy um, is not being assimilated well, and it gets like stuck in the head. And sometimes it could be, you know, full of stress or like blockages or, you know, whatever it is. 
and and so it gets up there and it's already got a little bit of like inflammatory kind of energy uh in it you know it's tied okay. to circulation and um you know one of the things with migraines is there can be body tensions and um the the pain can get so bad that their body will kind of keep clamping down and one of the indicators that i look like i don't usually say anything but as i interact with a person i look to see if they're they're making fists like they they'll sometimes stand there and they'll like they'll make a fist but a lot of times they do it with like their thumb inside their hand and they'll just and you'll go you know you ask them like are you feeling relaxed and they'll go yeah but like they're they're in a fist it's it's because their body is is so tense because of either the pain or they're trying to manage the pain or the tension and so you know there's there's different ways of looking at it you know um you could look at it from the point of view as a circulatory issue you know there's always the um, emotional component but a lot of times what i like to do is you, you know you're looking at like different approaches like so you know there's the symptom oriented approach and then there's the symptom oriented approach where you're you're looking at body systems rather than a particular system or a symptom and then you know there's the energetic component and you know there's there's all these components uh that can all be mixed in and including in that is some physiological emotions or just you know psychological components like really pretty much everything has a psychological component but mm -hmm. here there is a higher higher potential for that like anytime you see like blood pressure low back pain migraines um uh it doesn't mean that it's emotional but emotions a lot of times or stress will aggravate it and sometimes they can be a cause of it and the the issue here too is it's not always the person's emotions it could be that they're around somebody else that's very emotional and the other person's emotional state can actually be causing the migraines. And, and so, you, you know, I usually do a little bit of um, just asking questions and not even really looking for an answer, but like you ask a few questions about some of the people around them, like what's going on, what's stress. And usually they'll go, oh, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine. And what about this person? Ah, they're fine. Like, you know, you can, you can mm -hmm. just see the body tense up and it's like, that's the person like, or that's the situation. You know what I mean? And you yes. don't have to discuss it a lot, but you know, then at least, you know, like, okay, like there, the, one of the worst cases that, that I had that was treated was there's this just gentle young woman that she just had this history of really super bad migraines. We were treating everything. I would ask her questions and nothing. And I would even ask her about the people around her, nothing. And then one day her husband showed up to pick her up and two minutes of interacting with him, I was like, that's her migraine right there. <laughs> He's a real a-hole. Like, you know, he was just, but she was trying to be so positive about it. Even if you asked her, like, is there somebody being really abrasive and aggressive? She'd say no. But as soon as you met him, you're like, that, that guy's abrasive to everybody like mm -hmm. you know how could you not have headaches around this guy right right and, and so you know it, it changed up the treatment and we we were able to treat it a little bit and, and you know don't need to go into that but um so it's one of those things where you almost have to become a little bit of a detective but he, here's some just straight up things that you can do right so one of the things is the marjoram can be good, is especially like with like spasms and tension. Um, one of the indicators that you look for is uh, spasms and tension in the jaw, the jaw clenching or tightness in the jaw. Um, and when I say jaw, I also include like around the ear and even a little bit in the temples. Um, uh, that uh, actually can aggravate or even cause um, uh, migraines. And in the old days, when I was still doing physical manipulation, one of the ways that we would treat it is I would get in and manipulate the jaw, like, you know, with my finger in the mouth and, you know, put gloves on and go in and just like work the mouth, like the, the muscles, like back where the jaw hinges. Right. And um, within a few sessions, the migraines, they didn't usually completely go away, but they went down about 70 to 80%. 
and then you can treat some of the other components. And so marjoram is a great way to do this. You could even have them uh, gargle with it. Like, like I'd go kind of heavy, like three, four drops and then a little bit of water and then, you know, really swish it around on a daily basis. I even had one person put a few drops in their hand and take it and then like, you know, dab, dab, and then like rub on like the gum line, but like farther back in the jaw muscles. Um, just to take some of the tension out. Not everybody's going to do that, but like if somebody's desperate, um, that's a thing to try. Okay. Um, uh, you can you can have them rub a little bit, like you know, behind the jaw and like under the ear and around the ear. Um, that will take some of the tension out. And one of the things that I look for there as well is um, is there cramping in other parts of the body? Like, are they getting uh, half cramps or you know cramps in their feet? you know, just any sort of cramping, you know, usually it's more leg related, but um, if so, that means a magnesium deficiency that, um, again, treating that won't necessarily make it go away, but it takes the edge off. And you can do that with marjoram and you can augment with giving them a little bit of magnesium, uh, four or 500 milligrams usually uh, daily. Uh, just it takes about six weeks to increase the serum levels of magnesium in the body. So they would have to take it for a while. But um, so there's that component. The vetiver is, is very helpful because um, for one, it helps kind of pull them in their body um, if they're checking out a little bit, especially if they're dealing with difficult people or a difficult situation. But part of the issue is the energy going up, it hits the, the base of the skull. And migraine literally means like pain on one side of the head, you know, but there can even be a beginning of like what they call occipital neuralgia, which is like at the base of the skull. Um, and then it can radiate up into like one part of the head. So, um, you know, how we do that, um, with a bed of a rollerball or whatever, where you go all along the base of the skull and up along the side of the medulla area, that little indention in the center. Mm -hmm. um, and then the tops of the shoulders here. Um, it helps to loosen up that nuchal ligament. It relaxes those areas. I mean, vetiver is very, very relaxing. It increases circulation, but not like in a way that's hot. You know, because you already have a lot of blood flow in the head. So you're you're not really driving a bunch of blood into the head like you would with a cephalic. You're 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 just kind of opening up that area to have circulation so that everything starts to relax and blood starts to move both to and from the area. You know, just like the clinching in the hands, you could almost say like their head is clinching in a way. Like so being able to relax the that nuchal ligament actually allows for blood to move to and from the area a little bit more and allows for um, uh, greater relaxation of like the jaws, the head, the shoulders, like all that, even a little bit of deepening of the breath. Um, the other thing that is always a big issue with um, migraines is um, the spine can be really, um, uh, like congested, like um, uh, like it, it gets like really impacted in, energetically, um, uh, emotions, but also just tension, like the little muscles that go from vertebrae to vertebrae can also be very blocked up. And so there you could do either the vetiver or the marjoram. Um, you could even do the, let's say, cubeba on the spine itself, but also I'd probably do the arms and the legs as well. Like I'd sweep the arms and the legs quite substantially with somebody with migraines, you know, or or put the let's say a cubeba on that as well, just to help open that up. Um, then the 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 big thing that the big thing that I would say about um, migraines, I would say this even about high blood pressure. I would say this about even uh, excessive lower emotions, even the tendency to get triggered by things very easily. It's, it's a condition of excess. And what I mean by excess is 
too much energy in certain spots in the body. Like there's an excess of energy that's not like flowing or moving. And so you could call it congestion, but sometimes we have this tendency to like accumulate this energy in a particular area. And really when you back up and look at it from a point of view, if you, if you go back to energetic anatomy, it's almost always an issue with health rays. You know, the health rays um, are associated with the pores of the skin and, you know, you have like these perpendicular lines that come out of you and they basically get really congested and, and like clogged up or really super dro droopy. And so, you know, a way to think about it is, you know, we, we have an energy body where we look like a luminous egg kind of walking around with this body that looks like a, a pit in a, in a piece of fruit. Um, but we also, like if you kind of change the frequency of what you're looking at and you're looking at the health rays, we also look like a porcupine. You know, we have all these lines coming out of us that allow us to expel dirty energy out and then absorb energy in, right? Mm -hmm. And what happens a lot of times with uh, conditions like this going like brain fatigue, anxiety, um, uh, migraines, um, ang anger, uh, things like this, is <clears throat> the health days are, um, they're congested, they're entangled, they're a little bit droopy. Now, to take it a step further, we have, you know, this isn't talked about very much in, in different places, but um, we tap on it when we kind of do some of our practices, but um, you know, we're going to be talking about uh, a much deeper dive in energetic anatomy and how it interacts with the physiology over the next, uh, you know, several classes and even into the beginning of the year. And part of the issue is that you have these outer health rays, but you also have these inner health rays. And part of the issue is that Sometimes the outer health rays maybe get kind of cleaned up a little bit, but the inner health rays that are basically like a porcupine, but going inward towards the bone, they're even more congested than the outer ones. And, you know, there's different ways of, of treating it. One of the easiest and the simplest ways is to use um, basil, right? basil and you just can have the person inhale just on different parts of their body like it doesn't even have to be chakras you just start having them do like the torso and the uh, shoulders and the hips and the legs this will make them expel quite substantially and think of it like this like your your health rays are not just your ability to absorb energy and expel energy it's also your ability to let out stagnant energy but physiologically it's also tied to how well your body is able to detoxify right so your ability to detoxify even stagnant blood in an area um, is dependent on the health rays. If you have like, you know, really heavy energy in the kidneys and in the liver and things like this, again, you still go back to there's the outer health rays, but there's also the inner health rays. And a lot of times the inner health rays are significantly more ingested. And so, you, you know, when we talk about basil in the African tradition, they refer to basil as um, devil chaser. And, you know, they don't really give a big explanation, but part of it is the reason why basil is considered devil chaser is it opens up these inner health rays and it allows you to detoxify and release things. So you're releasing toxic materials, but you're also releasing like lower emotions, you're, you're releasing things that are like repeated thoughts in the mind. Um, you know, toxicity, not just in the body, but in the emotions and the mind. And you could even say like anger or anxiety or being triggered is also an issue of excess. Like there is an accumulation of that kind of emotion stuck in the body and it just becomes easier and easier to trigger it. So when you go through and you open things up with the basil, it just helps to allow for things to expel. And so if you think about what I'm saying with opening up the health rays and the inner health rays, 
is that, you, you know, it's a bit more complicated than this, but still like the simplified version is anytime you open up the health rays, you're stimulating lymphatic movement. You know, bottom line, you're stimulating okay. lymphatic movement. And, and if you go back to what we're talking about with the migraine, where it's the Ming men is shooting too much energy up, part of the thing that the Ming men does is it affects uh, blood pressure. It is a big component of how you're able to circulate blood through the body, but also how you're able to circulate lymph. And so part of the, the issue is a lot of times is um, also lymphatic circulation. And so you, you're not gonna be able to just say like, do these two oils and it's gonna make it better. You kind of have to do this like little bit of a dance with some of these different oils, opening things up. And it, as you go through and open up the, the inner health rays, that person's lymphatic system will start to detoxify. Usually where well, they'll feel it is in the throat and in the low back because the throat is the center for lymphatic function. And then the Ming Men is tied to circulating the lymph in the body. And then the next time the, they might start to feel um, like heaviness in the limb sometimes, you know, heaviness or they'll start to feel it like itchy limbs. And it's just because energies are coming from deep and they're releasing. And so you do need to keep um, all of that moving. Um, when, if you were to do a very deep, intense um, release of those inner health rays, a lot of times they'll start to have a little bit of a cough, not like a lung cough or a belly cough. They just have like a cough right here that, you know, and it's not even like a spasmodic cough. It's just so much energy is coming out that um, it will cause a little bit of a cough. And so whenever you start to see that, you do need to step up how you're, you're treating lymphatic function. But you know, first I, I would go through and do the marjoram and the vetiver and, and like unwind all of that. And then as time goes by, open up the outer health rays for a little bit, you know, like a session or two. And then after that, go deeper with the, the inner health rays. And as you do the inner health rays, um, then, um, you need to work the lymphatic system. And you you could say, you, uh, you, you know, we could talk about this for like a whole weekend. In fact, at some point we are. We are. But, you know, it starts to affect the protective webs. It starts to affect, you know, other mechanisms, part of the nervous system. Like this, this mechanism that I'm talking about, um, this is why I don't like to use the term psychosomatic is it just makes it seem like it's the mind and the nervous system. This is a bigger issue for psychosomatic issues than the mind and the somatic nerves. And, and it's because it's like um, not allowing you to detoxify and release lower emotion. It's not allowing you to release like some of the instinctive responses that then keep getting more and more agitated. And then eventually it does start to affect the mind and the somatic nerves and the sensory nerves. And because anytime you have um, congestion in the lymphatic system, it overstimulates the sensory nerves that then affects the, the, the motor nerves. It's like this whole chain reaction. And then, um, you know, then it becomes what we traditionally call psychosomatic. But, you know, three, three different times, um, uh, different therapy groups approached me for charting out how psychosomatic issues worked. And when uh, we started getting to the bottom of it, because, you know, I wasn't even working by myself. I was working with other, like an osteopath and these other things. And and when we started getting to the bottom of it, um, I, I, I actually cut, like stopped, like, I'm, you know, I'm going to stop, stop this project. I gave them their money back because I knew it was so out of the box for what they thought it was that... Uh, 
it was not going to be utilized. It was going to, you know, they were just going to get in arguments about it. It was just, it was not going to be looked at because we have this like really two dimensional idea of what psychosomatic issues are. And if you look at what we're saying here with the ability to detoxify, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally, if you don't detoxify, the body just be keeps becoming toxic. And then the next progressive um, uh, step is the nervous system gets agitated and then it does turn into a psychosomatic issue. Just to treat it as psychosomatic implies that it's something that the person's thinking or doing and it's not, they're toxic. Like their body is literally toxic. And like you could almost say like the more pressure you put on them about like, let's address this as a, like a psychosomatic issue. Like there's something in your mind, there's something in your emotions doing it almost makes it worse. Like, so a lot of times when you see people who are really targeting psychosomatic issues, um, they usually don't get any better or they usually start getting worse because of so many pieces are, are missing in the, the treatment approach. And so when we go through and treat it like this, it just, it unwinds. And, you know, there might be a few little bits where, you know, you're spelling kind of hard and you need to take some extra salt baths. Like cough, the coffee for the coffee salt baths, also very good for opening up the, the inner health rays. And it's very good for stimulating lymphatic movement. And, you know, so there's areas where this could overlap, but, um, uh, over the next few classes, we are going to be talking about all these components and, and really going deep on it as a little bit of time progresses, but uh, it, it's, it's uh, there's enough there for you to go through and treat, but like right. I, I can present it in a way that like once you understand like the like the physiology, psychology, and energy components and how they overlap. And sometimes it's just different words saying the same thing. It becomes much easier to go through and treat. You know, it's just um, presenting it in a way where it just all kind of falls together. Okay, so if I, I want to sort of recap to make sure I understood. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And starting with the migraine one, you said start with yeah, the migraine. Uh, ironically, the migraine, uh, the other issue that these congested health rays contribute to is arthritic conditions, which that, that is your hip issue too. So, I mean, we're talking about migraines, but that's why I was like, what's the other condition? Because there's a good chance it overlaps. And I would say yeah. it very much overlaps, very, very much overlaps. I, I felt an overlap. overlap. I felt an overlap, but I couldn't. I didn't have yeah. enough background to know what that overlap yeah. was. So still doesn't change what I would do with the hip. Like the things that we talked about for the hip, I would stick with it. But a lot of opening up health rays, a lot of like relaxing the body and opening up health rays. Like if you just use that as your mantra for a little bit, um, you know, it's not going to be an overnight success, but, you, you know, in chronic conditions like this, you have to kind of look at it more like big picture, like, you know, we're going to treat this over a period of time, you know, over a couple months or something. And, you, you know, it doesn't even have to be once a week. You can just put things in motion and the person should feel better and better. You know, sometimes there's other factors that, uh, contribute, you know, going back to the a-hole husband or something like that. Mm -hmm. But even that, you're releasing some of the emotions and the thinking. And a lot of times without even talking about it, they start handling themselves or behaving differently in those situations. And sometimes even those situations kind of resolve themselves because these same mechanisms we're talking about for migraine and arthritis and things also are about calming lower emotions, calming the mind, releasing anger, and then also um, overcoming obstacles. And, you know, the evil husband, call, call it what you want, but it's an obstacle. Like, you know, I would just say that that is an obstacle. Like that's an obstacle for feeling good, for moving forward in life, for having a healthy relationship, whatever it is. And so, you know, without talking with that one woman, 
she was very, very nice, always projected goodness on the people. And, you know, she had her version of uh, come to Jesus meeting with the husband. You know, you or I would probably never call it a come to Jesus meeting. It was still probably a very polite conversation. But um, she kind of just said, like, things need to change and, you know, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. And it, it did change the environment. It didn't change his nature, but he tempered himself a little bit, at least for a little while. I, I luckily know this woman, her husband, her son, her daughter, mm -hmm. and there is not conflict in the family. Oh, good. Uh, they are yeah. all that makes amazing. it easy. Yeah, they're yeah, all yeah. amazing people, and so I, I, I know that that's not the issue, but there are other issues that are driving it. So, starting with the marjoram, hip, hip could be contributing as well. But yeah, okay. Starting with the marjoram, you said gargle three or four drops daily and rub it around the ear and the jaw. And if she's okay yeah. with it, rub it on the uh, back of the gum line. Yeah, like yeah. Uh, like where the, where the jaw hinges. It's not even the gum line. Like if you kind of poke, like stick your finger back uh, where your jaw like hinges, like here, like in front of the ear, but on the inside, there's this kind of muscle that runs down and as soon as you touch it, it's real tight and it almost feels like it burns a little bit. It burns because it's so tight. And so if she okay. just takes like a couple of drops of the marjoram and gets back there and just kind of rubs it on there, um, it, it will relieve some uh, tension in there substantially. And is that part of it an ongoing daily thing or is that when she- Probably for a while. Yeah, okay. probably for a while. Yeah, I would just do it prophylactically. Like I would do pre prevention for a while. Because okay. the, like the thing is, is when they're in a migraine, it's like it's crisis mode and you're just trying to stabilize it. But the goal is to try to prevent it and uh, treating it when they're in the crisis um, is is not going to do prevention. You're, you're just calming things down. Okay. And so that sort of leads to the vetiver. I see the, the vetiver on the base of the skull and around the ears and the where the jaws hinge is a very preventative kind of thing, an ongoing. Preventative, yeah, and you could you could do that during a migraine crisis, like when they're okay. in the middle of it. I, I mean, it might not do something immediately, but it does calm it down somewhat, and it does calm down the neuralgia that happens on the occipital area. And um, I've had people use it, and it's taken it down forty or fifty percent. And I've had others where it didn't do a lot. Okay. So so then, okay, so then next was Litsia Kubeba on the spine, the arms, and the legs. And is yeah. that a uh, prophylactic or during? Um, you probably could do that either way. Like you, okay. I, I would probably do it prophylactically, but um, even that uh, you could do um, as... Um, in crisis management, especially the arms and the legs, and it would probably help, you know, because going back to like the tension in the arms, it would, it would help them to like relax. And, and so if you take the tension out of the arms and legs, a lot of times the, the torso will start to relax and you're, you're also trying to transmute some lower emotions, even if it's just the emotions from pain. And if the arms and legs are tight, very little energy can like be transmuted. If you relax the arms and legs, you're able to transmute significantly more. So it becomes easier to like let go of, of the energy, you know, the emotional response to pain, to past emotions that might contribute to it, you know, mental thinking, you know, whatever it is. Okay. You know, some, sometimes people who have migraines grind on themselves a lot, you know. Yes. Like, like they don't measure up or they need to be better or they need to be like more perfect or something like that. It helps to calm some of that down. Okay. And then sort of moving beyond those, we get to the uh, working on the health rays and especially starting with basal, uh, sustain mm -hmm. inhalation and just move through body parts to get the yeah, I mean, health rays to open up. I would do basal second. Um, I would okay. do either the blend health rays. I would do um, like helichrysum. Um, you could actually even use the Litsia cubeba to open up the external health rays, but open up the external health rays first. 
Like if you open those up, then when the energy starts to come out, it has a place to go. Like if okay. they're real, if they're real super congested externally, when you start to release things internally, it just plugs up the health rays even more. So that's why I was saying, like do a couple of sessions of just opening up the external health rays. And then once they're open, then, um, then do the basal where they go into different parts of their body. And, and okay. Yeah. Okay. And again, that's prophylactic. Yeah. Um, eventually, when that gets opened up, it can be in the middle of the crisis, but at first, it will probably aggravate the condition because you're just moving too much energy and it gets stuck. Okay. I wouldn't do that while they're in the middle of a crisis. Okay. And yeah. in the middle of a crisis, would coffee salt baths help or not? It, it can. Um, like I've had some people do that. It, I mean, it, it is very cleansing. Um, and coffee, because it's so cleansing, it can be a little bit uh, like a little bit depleting, which when you're dealing with a condition that is a condition of excess, that actually can be a good thing. You know, if you're dealing with somebody who is very depleted already, it, it might make them feel better, but they probably will just end up sleeping more. But in a, in a particular case like this, having a, like a strong coffee bath will diminish some of the energy that's contributing to the migraine, you know, but potentially. I mean, that, that's the thing, you know, I keep saying potentially because it's almost like every migraine person is like they have similar tendencies. And then there's also a little bit of a unique component where you almost need to learn the personality of their particular migraine. Like, it's not like you can just go, oh, like a cut, you do this and you can right. do that on everybody and 95% of the time it will work. Migraines are like, you gotta kind of go like, where are you from? How'd you get here? What'd, what you mm -hmm. doing? Like, you, know, you, you really have to kind of get to know the, the condition to where's the pain person. how does your body yeah. react uh yeah. yes, what exactly. tends to take you out of it yeah. uh so okay yeah. going back to the hips if we can uh sure. uh so you talked about making sure they get an x-ray uh if there's if it's bone on bone we have to take a different route than others but uh certainly start with joint relief in a strong ointment two to three times a day. Um, rotate it with something like lymphatic gland, Arthrocare, Eucalyptus yeah. Citridora, and you said something else, and I didn't get the something else. Oh, Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then and, and the, the, the different thing there is like if, if they're bone on bone, I mean, either they need to rest a little bit more or they need to switch their exercise. Because even like, there's been times where um, they'll get on like an exercise bike because it's not weight bearing, but there's so many, like, you know, you're rotating that pedal like 90 times a minute or 80 times a minute, still so much movement is aggravating yes. that. Where you can get yes. in the pool and just gently kind of move around get some exercise and not have so much movement on that joint, that's usually better. Um, uh, okay. or just best. But, you know, we, we had an employee here one time, uh, this is several years ago, and he, you know, he had a bone on bone situation and um, he, he went and saw the doctor and, you know, he decided, you know, they, they had set like a surgery date and everything. And he decided to, to um, exercise it before surgery, which is what you do most times, right? And, um, you know, I told him, oh boy, talk that out with your doctor. Like, I don't know that that's a good idea because he started walking like really long distances. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you're going to cause a lot of pain. And the other issue is because you're causing so much um, uh, inflammation in the body and stagnating the lymphatic system so much, I go, careful because you'll start getting sick a lot. Like, you know, you, you mm -hmm. won't be able to get over an illness. And he started walking and within like two or three weeks, he was bedridden and um, 
could barely walk. And then on top of that, he'd get sick and then he'd get better. And then he'd get sick and he got better. And even when it came time for him to have the surgery, um, he, uh, they weren't sure that they're going to be able to do the surgery because he was already sick again. Like, and you right. know, we can't do surgery when you're sick. And, but it's like, that's the issue is it's not just pain as you start to get like kind of almost like sickly a little bit. Like you just don't recover from colds and flus. And now with COVID, that's an extra like, ugh, that's an extra red flag. So, yeah. uh, you know, keep the lymphatic system as fluid as possible. Okay. You know, in the, in the old days, like back a uh, hundred years ago, when somebody, you know, because in the old days, this issue was a thing because they'd get thrown from horses. And so they were really good at treating, you know, bone on bone hip issues. But I mean, the person was usually like bedridden or, you know, but how they, how they would maintain the person's health is they would just give them massive dosages of herbs that um, stimulated lymphatic movement. And if you look at the old herbal books, when they say um, uh, like basically bone on bone hip or like arthritic hip, it's just all lymphatic herbs. Like that's what they did. And so they recognized that. I remember one said something like, if you don't treat it lymphatically, you know, it's a different time. So this doesn't apply to now, but basically if you don't treat it lymphatically, it will basically shorten that person's life. And it's just because they get real sickly and then they end up dying from, you know, a fever or some, you know, some, some other. Right. Issue. Something unrelated, but. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So then you also talk.